Hello. So, hey out there, my name is Julie Fayfan Balzer, and I am an artist, an author, an instructor, and a mom to the cutest little two year old in the world. Uh, so, welcome to Book Club. This is a free monthly um, club where we just get together and talk about some kind of art related book. This month, we are talking about Mixed Media Masterclass. Um, this is by Cheryl Kahn, and this is an older book, but very much available. Um, it was written or published, I guess I should say, in 2013, which probably means it was written in 2011, 2012. And um, because it's an older book, you've probably seen a lot of the techniques that are in here. This is definitely, if you're a technique junkie, this is a technique junkie book. There aren't really any projects in here. It's just sort of jumps tech technique to, to technique. And Cheryl Kahn's work is beautiful. And there's lots of great big photography in here that all of that said, the short sort of review that I'm going to give you is that you're not going to actually learn to make any artwork like she makes. She kind of more takes you through her techniques. Um, and she also, I'm not 100% sure that it's super for beginners because I found the instructions a little bit light, but I could be wrong. So chime in if you've read this book, if you know this book, I can see I have a couple of people popping in to say hi. So Hey, Polly, thanks for stopping in. And hi, Susan, uh, and everybody else out there too. Um, feel free to chime in with your thoughts on the book and anything else you want to add. But I figure we might as well get started because I got a big pile of samples here. I spent the better part of a week making all kinds of samples. Uh, and I didn't even do every technique in the book. So let's go ahead and get started. Hi, Carol. So I'm going to add in here, uh, Kathy Berg says that she just ordered it, which is always nice to hear. And Chrissy's saying hi and Sherry's saying hi from Washington State. Hello. Okay, so Mixed Media Master Class. Uh, this is, as you can see, in a very attractive book, totally nice looking, which is always nice to see. Um, and when you go inside, one of the things I found the most interesting is that she uses really only one single two page spread. And in that single two page spread, what she does is that is where she absolutely does the most, um, just going over the supplies. Like this is kind of it. There isn't like a really extensive supply list. And the good and the bad of that is that um, you don't really have to use everything that's here, but there are also a lot of supplies. So if you're a hoarder like me, you may find that you have a lot of supplies. So hey, everybody out there. Um, Nancy Wilkinson says she has had the book for years and she loves it. Donna said she read a great, a good portion of the book and she found some of the techniques interesting. Always good. Interesting is a funny word, isn't it? Sometimes I can mean a lot of things when I say interesting. Okay, so let's just jump right in. So cheesecloth is the first technique that she shares. And you can see that she has a very loose weave cheesecloth in a lot of these images, particularly like right here. And this is a good example of the kind of illustrations. So I ended up buying a very high quality cheesecloth according to the Amazon reviews, which is uh, kind of problematic because it doesn't have that pretty loose weave. So here is the nice high quality cheesecloth that I bought. And so again, you can see it's a much tighter weave than what she showed. So you probably wanna buy some cheaper, um, sort of not as nice cheesecloth. This is just a technique of sewing it on top of a piece of tissue paper. And then there's another piece of paper back here so to sort of play with the transparency. And then I did some paint splatters on top. Um, in these two samples, I was just playing around with the idea of either putting the cheesecloth sort of flat on it, and you can see right there, right, this is the paper, this is the cheesecloth, so that's the kind of texture it adds, a little bit like burlap or something like that. Um, and then this is the idea of gluing it on kind of wrinkly to give me some texture. Now, this isn't actually something she really talks about in the book, but you know, from experimenting and experience, having worked with cheesecloth and other things before, I know that that can be a really fun way to work with textured things because this is a nice solid surface now that the gel medium has all dried. Um, so Carolyn says, I agree with your thought that it was low on the actual instruction value, but it was filled with great ideas. 100%. So who is this book for then? And again, like this is the instruction. 
One, glue cheesecloth to the chosen surface. Two, paint the cheesecloth with liquid paint or dye. Three, add embellishments as desired. So I think this book is for someone who maybe is not a super beginner, who already has a lot of supplies, who's looking for like a couple fresh ideas, because like Carolyn says here, it was low on actual instruction value, but filled with great ideas. I think that's a really good way of putting it. And Kathleen says, I read every word in the book and enjoyed it. But yes, very technique-y and beautiful. Totally, totally beautiful. Okay, so that's some cheesecloth. I'm going to start a big pile on the floor over here of uh, samples as we go through. Um, then cloth paper is something that was really big 10 years ago when this book was written. And in fact, oddly enough, I actually, I have a monthly membership program and in my, uh, membership program, we actually did cloth paper a couple different times in the last, like maybe three or four months, which I thought was funny. So this is actually a sample that I made during a, um, member live stream. So you can see like, this is sort of a paisley fabric that I didn't love. That's kind of the back of it. And what you do essentially is you glue paper to the top of it, tissue, all kinds of stuff. You can paint over it, which you can see I've done. You can stamp over it and it becomes this kind of really hardy. It's fabric, it's paper. You can use it, you know what I mean? To like um, cover a book. It's um, hardier than fabric, but it's stiffer than fabric or it's hardier than paper, but it's stiffer than fabric. Um, and you can see, right, you can collage in. I have some jelly paper. Looks like there's some book pagey things. There's definitely some tissue paper in here. You can even use um, heavier papers if you want to, but it's a nice kind of like mixture again of paper and fabric. And again, it's called cloth paper. You can get the instructions in the book or there are actually tons and tons of YouTube videos. I also obviously you can get the instructions in my membership too. Uh, and you can see that... Uh, Donna here says, I think it's a good springboard uh, to then use the info as you see fit. I think that's a great point, especially since she doesn't really tell you how to make the art that she makes. She's just showing you the techniques that she uses to make like the materials that she uses to put it together. Even in some of her samples, um, she'll have multiple things that she's doing. So here's a sample and it says, this composition was created by collaging a series of papers, including cloth paper and deli paper to a piece of illustration board. Um, I coordinated the design by layering diluted acrylic washes, which you can find on page 35 over selected areas. I used various colored pencils to emphasize areas and create a stronger composition. After the painted drive, the colored pencil areas then stand out. Uh, that stand out are the strong red orange areas. So it's not really telling you how, but it is giving you some information of how she's like combining the techniques. So again, not going to take you through a project, but lots of great ideas. And again, as Donna says, there are no wrong answers. Well, unless it falls apart and then you can make something new out of it. Right. Um, so Kathy's asking, what would you use the cloth paper for? So like I mentioned, um, I've used it in the past for covering, um, book paper for covering like books, like the cover of a book. You can use it, um, you know, for the spine of a book. I think it's really useful in book binding, but I think other people use it for all kinds of things, decorative uses. You can certainly use it like collage paper. It's just, you know, it's fabric paper. So it's kind of a mixture of the two. Okay, so next up, um, this is a technique she was saying where she puts copy paper underneath her fabric while she paints, right? So basically she's painting fabric and then the, it's leaking through. So like on my work surface, you can see this happens to be a Teflon sheet, but underneath I have a piece of paper. And if I were to flip it over, you'd see, right, that it ends up getting all the stuff that I'm kind of been working on. So I think this is a thing that we've all been doing, but nonetheless, I decided to be a little more purposeful about it. So he painted this piece of fabric I had and I put two pieces of paper underneath it. And so now uh, you can actually really see, right? This is the paper that was underneath this fabric while I was painting it. And now I have both the painted fabric and the painted paper. So just a reminder at all times that whatever's underneath is worthy of keeping, which I think is an important thing to say. Okay. So, um, copy paper texture. At the beginning of the book, I really did do every single technique because I was really interested in what was happening. And then I kind of fell off at the end. By the way, here are some sort of less pretty examples of times when I just had the copy paper underneath whatever I was working on. And you can see sometimes it's great and sometimes it's nothing. But all of this would make really fun collage paper too. So, 
always a good technique. And copy paper is definitely cheap and easy, and it collages really well. I've been using a lot of it in my artwork. So this copy paper texture is another easy technique. And here you go. You can see it. Basically, I had a piece of paper that had some stuff on it, which I just didn't need. So I painted it, crumpled it up, and then I painted it and ironed it out. And you can kind of see, I think the texture that's in it. You could obviously do it with a plain piece of paper too, but the thing I think is nice about it is not necessarily as a whole piece of paper, but when you have it in a little piece, you know, and then you put it like on a tag or something, you can see it's really nice, especially with that gold and gives a big thing. But if you look at this, it seems kind of ugly. And I think that's true of a lot of collage paper. I think people think that their collage paper should be beautiful. And I think that's a huge mistake because your collage paper should really just kind of be like interesting or have something to it. Because even some of these ugly papers ugh, that I threw on the ground, right? If we wanted to really turn this tag into some kind of work of art, you know, there's some lovely stuff in here that we could use. It's just a matter of sort of limiting what you're seeing so that you're not seeing all of it, right? But now that becomes really interesting. And could we not, you know, steal a nice big piece of color from here, you know, and suddenly with a little bit of stitching, this actually becomes really attractive when it looks like it came from a bunch of garbage. But the problem is if your original papers are really beautiful, at least my experience is the composition usually doesn't work because um, instead of making something that's greater, you're sort of stuck staring at the original pieces. That's kind of the way that I would put it, you know? Uh, and Sophia, absolutely, I agree with you. Some of the best collage bits I've ever used come from the ugliest papers and I think these are the kind of collage papers I have in my stash that I use all the time. Even something that's as blank as this is so great for collage material. You can always end up adding into it or cutting out of it. And even the texture that you get from paper that's been wet, I think is really cool. So something to think about. I might kind of keep this. I kind of like this little tag now. I think it's really, really pretty. Okay, let's put that to the side and maybe keep it. Uh, okay, so the other thing I was going to say about this, um, oh, I also wanted to bring up Sherry's comment here where she says it's amazing what happens to ugly paper when used in another art project in pieces. 100%. These reminded me of kimonos. I don't know if anybody else can see that, but just I think that sort of T structure a little bit. Okay, so I didn't do this one about creating fabric cord. This is, so this water spotted craft tissue is something I do with my two-year-old son almost every day. So I buy bleeding tissue paper and I just either pin it up to the wall or put it in a plastic container. And basically as you spray it with water and he, A, he loves using a spray bottle and B, it actually is really good for your um, coordination and your hand strength when you're little to use a spray bottle. But you can see like if it's been hanging on the wall, it gets the vertical drips from where there was an orange piece of paper on it. If it's laying down in like on a um, Teflon mat or anything like that, this is where like a black piece was laying on top of it and it just starts to stain in color. And then when there was water just on the blue, you can see it sort of removed the color. And again, this is beautiful paper for using in collage and all sorts of materials. You can definitely, you know, cut it down, rip it down. And it becomes such an intriguing little thing. I've even made some earrings out of this, but I think it's absolutely beautiful. So this is a super easy technique to do, right? Uh, oh, haha, <laughs> Donna says that she wrote about the kimonos in her notes about it. So yes, we're very much on the same page about those kimonos. And again, that's uh, back here, these shapes. Okay, so then we moved on to inkjet images. This is one of the techniques that didn't work for me, and a couple techniques didn't work for me, and it may have been the photo I chose, you know, but um, here you go. I, I printed a photo, and I sprayed it with water, and I guess you can see some water spotting in here. I think the back is kind of cooler than the front. Um, I do notice that she used photo paper in some of these as opposed to like just regular paper. Um, but what was interesting is she didn't say anywhere that it had to be on photo paper. And this is what I mean about light on instructions. I can see that this says these pieces use digital images on photo paper sprayed with water immediately. Whereas this just says um, 
you know, note the key is to spray immediately after print comes out of the printer. And then it just says spray water on fresh drink ink jet print and allow to dry. So I don't know if it would have worked better if it was on photo paper and been more sort of abstract or if she started with images that were already more abstract or what. But this wasn't great. Although I will say again, like I'm pretty sure I could, you know, cut something out of this. You know, and that might be a pretty piece. Again, I like the back better than the front. Maybe put it with this water spotted paper, you know, and that might be a pretty piece for collage. But again, I also don't think like every technique has to work for you. Another option I did think about is printers have changed over time. And it's possible that inkjet printers were way worse <laughs> in 2013 or when this book was written, 2012, 2011. And that because inkjet technology is better, the it, they don't run as much. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Carolyn does add that the water spotting didn't work well for her. I also thought the back of the paper looked more interesting than the water on the actual image. 100%. Uh, Sophia says, what would you use to collage the tissue paper with given it's so super reactive to wetness? Oh, I just use matte medium and like it, it runs a tiny bit, but not so much that it bothers me. Uh, do you paint on the bleeding tissue before pinning to the wall and then spray with water? No, it's literally just pieces of tissue paper that you spray with water. Literally all it is. You just take a bunch of tissue paper and spray it with water. So nothing fancy about it whatsoever. Okay. I didn't have any Lutrador, which is the next technique in the book. So I didn't do that one. Um, and then... I have, I've used transfer artist paper before, and so I didn't feel the need to do it, but it's a great way to do an image transfer if you're interested. Again, same with the chalk pastels and the matte medium. I've done this before, so I started to get, wanted to start doing things that I hadn't done before. I tried the glazing with the oil pastels. It's another technique that didn't work for me. Um, I've done glazing with paint watches, so I didn't feel the need to do it. And I think like, again, sometimes you need to pink and choose. Ink tents is one of my favorite things. I've been doing a ton of that. Um, I don't have the pencils. I have the ink tents blocks, but these are some examples. Here's a little, um, mono print that I did. So I drew this side and I sprayed it with water and then flipped it and printed it. And you can see I have my ghost which is just a lighter version of the original there. So that was a really fun kind of print to do. And then in this one, I tried to follow her instructions where she was telling you to put gesso over it and do whatever else. And I don't know. I think, it, I mean, it is what it is. But ink tents, if you're interested, they're really fun to use. And again, that's something that I have been doing in the membership. Um, we've been doing a lot of stuff with ink tents lately, sort of coincidentally. Okay, water-soluble markers. This one was fun. So I drew with some water-soluble markers onto fabric. One of the things I really did appreciate about this book so much is that so many of the techniques can be done on paper and fabric. And I think that's great because it makes you realize that paper and fabric are not that far apart. It's not something special to do. Um, by the way, Jill says, I once took a class in altering photo images and because photo printing is now dry printing compared to when Photoshop's did a wet printing, the process just didn't work. I believe it. I believe it 100%. And Sophia says, uh, oh, I love the monoprint idea with the ink tents. I have the blocks too. Definitely going to give that a try. Good. I hope you will. It's lots of fun. So here you can see that I drew, by the way, I am going to actually show you some techniques, but I picked out my one, two, three, four, five, six favorites. And those are the ones I'm going to show you. Okay. So here you can see I did some just drawing and doodling with water soluble markers. Then I sprayed it like crazy with water. And I actually also put another piece of fabric underneath it when I sprayed it so that the color sort of wicked out and went crazy. You can see a few places where the marker still exists. And then I also got this secondary piece of fabric from underneath where some of the color transferred out. So that's kind of a nice one. Although again, because this is water soluble, this isn't a fabric that you can wash or do anything with because it's just going to come right out. But you can certainly use it for a dry project that's going to go on the wall or something like that. Um, then we got into resists. I love resists. This is a crayon resist. Super simple. You draw with a white crayon just like on the Easter eggs, right? 
And then you just put paint over it and the crayon resists that too, which is really cool. Uh, Sherry's asking, what kind of fabric is that? So for all the samples that I did, I just used muslin. Nothing fancy, just a cotton muslin. Super cheap, super easy. Okay, and then this is, I tried a crayon resist by rubbing on top of a foam stamp and you can maybe kind of see the foam stamp, but it didn't work as well as I would have liked. Then I tried the crayon rubbing using a um, stencil and that worked a little bit better. So that's kind of another cool way to do it. Then I tried a crayon rubbing using a rubber stamp and it was fine. You know, again, like not as great and distinct. It's a very soft result, which, you know, is fine. But then I saw this, which I had never heard of, which is a glue stick resist. So this is the glue stick resist. And if you compare the crayon resist and the glue stick resist, it's kind of amazing, right? The glue stick is so clear. So I thought I would show you how to do that. So I have a small piece. Again, this is just muslin, cotton muslin, nothing fancy, okay? And I have a rubber stamp right here. And I have a Yoohoo glue stick, which happens to be my favorite glue stick, but I think you can use any glue stick, frankly. And then I'm just going to rub across the top of this with the glue stick. Okay. And then I'm just going to move it because I have a big enough piece of fabric and try it a second time. I'm getting a lot of glue off this stick. I had a drier glue stick before. Well, this may not work, but we'll see. It'll be exciting. Okay. So I'm going to close up that glue stick. And then while the glue is still wet, uh, I'm going to take a spray bottle of water and kind of get the fabric wet. Again, I'm working on top of a Teflon sheet. You can also put some um, copy paper underneath to absorb, you know, whatever comes through. Then I'm just using regular fluid acrylic. You could use fabric paint, you could use dye, you could use whatever you want. And wherever the glue is, is gonna resist Oh, it looks like I didn't get a very good rubbing, but the glue is doing a very good job resisting. There you go. Probably needed a bolder stamp. So let's do that again. Let me grab a new stamp and see if I can't get a better impression than that. So I'll just put this over to the side to dry. Luckily, I have another piece of fabric and the quickest way to cut fabric if you ha don't know, is just cut a little snip and then rip it. Okay, so let's try that one more time with a bolder stamp and see if we can't get a better result because it's worked so well the first time. I suppose I could use the stamp that I used before. But where is the fun in that? Okay, so again, I'm going to rub with the glue stick. Oh, I can already see that it's a better impression. So bolder stamp instead of a fine line stamp. Oops, and I moved it, so I might as well move it along. So I'm just, again, like the glue stick is going on the raised areas of the rubber stamp, right? Because that's what's poking up. So now let us try this one more time. Spray, spray, spray. Throw a little bit of fluid acrylic on here. Now, what's the difference between using regular acrylic paint and fabric paint? Oh, I'm so glad that you asked. So contrary to popular belief, it's not that the non-fabric paint is going to come out unless it's water reactive, but it's more often that it changes the hand of the fabric, meaning the feel of the fabric, right? So regular acrylic paint is going to be stiff and make the fabric stiff, whereas fabric paint is going to keep the hand of the fabric nice and soft. There you go. That one worked really well. And if you want to darken any areas, just add a little more color on there, right? And you can see that resist even more. But the water is helping that resist along 
as well. So then what I did is I let this dry and then I used an iron with a piece of paper on top of it to kind of remove the glue. Ooh, the paper underneath is pretty cool. Pretty cool too. But let me try to hold this up. There you go. You can see how the glue stick did that resist. I think that's super neat, right? And a fun way to use your rubber stamps too. Okay, so I would not dry that piece of paper, by the way, and that um, uh, 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 fabric together because actually the paint will act as a glue and glue them together. Um, do you wash the fabric first? <laughs> Uh, no, that would require extra work that I'm not interested in doing, but you absolutely should probably wash the fabric first and get out anything. But these techniques are so, let me put it this way. These techniques are so like casual. You're using paint. You're not really using like dyes that care about it. So it's sort of less of an issue, I would say, than it might be if you were using like a formal dyeing process. I think that people think of um, surface design on fabric as being like a really intense, serious thing where you have to be super careful. And my experience most of the time is it's just like painting on fabric. If you're going to wash it, things get a little more complicated. If you're going to wear it, like I'm wearing a painted apron and it was done with fabric paint because I didn't want it to be hard. And, you know, this is soft. This feels like fabric because it's fabric paint. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of where you have to consider things. But if you've ever gotten paint on your clothes, you know, it's not coming out. That's usually not the issue. Okay. Uh, and Nancy says that she is going to be trying the glue stick resist, which is awesome. I love that. Okay. So let's keep going through the book now that we've looked at the glue stick resist. I just want to make sure I'm not going to put the book in a wet spot here. Uh, and let's keep on trucking. Spray bottle move. Okay. So, um, then this is another technique, like I've used masking tape on paper, but I had never used masking tape on fabric. So I was super curious if it was going to work because I thought, won't it wick into the fabric? But the trick here is that the fabric is already painted. And so that makes a huge difference in the resist. So let me show you some of the pieces that I made using this technique. So here's one. I think it's pretty obvious where the masking tape was, right? I just did these stripes and it looks really cool. And um, this was the paper that was underneath here when I was painting it. And you can see that it picked up, right, the spots where the masking tape was blocking it off. So I thought that was super cool. Um, these are two more samples using that masking tape resist. I thought this one was really, really neat the way that that fabric ended up looking kind of, um, I actually did the masking tape resist twice first this way and then this way with a stencil. And then this was kind of more like an abstract painting use of the masking tape method. Again, this is all fabric. Uh, and I thought that was super cool. So I thought we could do that today because that was another one of my favorite techniques. And I want to share all of my favorite techniques with you. So here is a piece of fabric that I have painted. Um, I did a, so every October I do this thing called Print Inktober where we um, print things. And one year I did all fabric printing. So this is part of a um, fat quarter that I had printed. The Actually, the other half of it is the apron uh, pocket. Ta-da! That I'm wearing right now. Um, but there is the, this half of the fabric, which is painted. And I did use fabric paints on this. So it's nice and soft and it feels like fabric. But you don't have to. So I didn't end up using masking tape. I ended up using this um, tape I really like from Blick called Artist Tape. And what I think is really cool is that it's super slick and water resistant. And the other thing is like, I found, let's say you don't want everything to be the same, right? The same, well, you just add another piece of tape on here and pretend that it's just fatter, you know, and you could also cut the ends so that they were even instead of ripped, but I kind of like that ripped look. So I'm just going to really quickly, maybe we won't do the whole piece of fabric because I don't want you to have to sit here all day, um, but I'm just going to put a bunch of sort of X's on here. Oh, my X's live in Texas. Actually, that's not true. All my X's live in New York City. 
Okay, so I am going to keep moving this around. And just, you know, you could do any pattern. You can be as creative as you want. You can make it as random. You could take a lot of time and cut some like pretty shapes out of it. But the idea is that anywhere that you've put the tape, no paint is going to go. So again, anywhere you've put the tape, no paint is going to go. So let's just do half to speed things along here a little bit. And let's again get some, I want to do some kind of a contrasting color maybe here. Let's see what, let's see what we can do. This is kind of a transparent paint, so I may need to, I need to need to amp it up, but let's see what happens. So I'm going to put out the paint. I'm working with a wet paintbrush. And at first I did worry that a brush would then like wick into the fabric, but it doesn't, doesn't seem to, at least from what I can tell. I think that's still going to be too transparent for me just looking at it right now, but maybe not. And I am going to put a piece of paper under here because again, I like that secondary thing that I'm getting. Let's put another color in and then maybe throw out some Thing a little crazy like this purple. And again, just throw it out, throw it out. So again, so many of the techniques in this book are not hard or complicated. They're actually quite easy and enjoyable. And it's just uh, most of the time patience in terms of waiting. So you are supposed to wait until this is dry to remove the tape. And I think that's because otherwise the paint wicks into the areas that are uh, wet, you know? So I'm gonna put this aside and hopefully it'll be close to dry by the end of book club and we can take a look at what it's gonna look like. But you can see, I might throw a little bit of blue in here too because I can. Um, and you can also, by the way, there were a couple times I got kind of fancy, if you can call it that. And, oh, that was heavy. Um, I'm gonna put a little bit of paint out onto my palette paper here. And by fancy, all I mean is I just drew some, you know, shapes on top of here. Not enough paint. Mm. Just like that. Doink, doink, doink. Okay. And you could keep going and you could do splatters. Let's see. Splatter, 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 splatter. Um, you know, doing whatever you want here. But let's put that aside to dry for a little bit and then see. I can't stop. I can't leave it alone. This is my whole personality problem. Uh, and then we'll see what we get in a little bit. So let's see. I've got wet things all over the floor. Oh, I already lost a piece of tape out of here. Here we go. Doot, 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 doot. What is one more wet thing on a pile of wet things when you really think about it? Okay. So uh, I'm going to just wipe this up and then we'll take a peek at that. If I forget for some reason, because, you know, uh, I tend to do that, uh, just, just yell at me towards the end to double check how that one is coming along. Okay, I think we're dry and clean. I make a lot of noises now that I have two-year-olds. Okay, who, I'm, who am I kidding? I made a lot of noises before I had a two-year-old. Okay, so again, here are my masking tape samples. So I'm just gonna toss those onto the ground. Uh, and then, 
The gesso resist was another really cool technique. I've done it before, but again, I've done it on paper, not on fabric. So here is the sample that I did. This is another really simple one, which I will show you right now how to do. I think you can see that a lot of the techniques that I personally gravitated to were a little bit later in the book. Um, but, you know, you may find that there's one section of the book that you personally gravitate to. I do think this is a book that could be interesting to many people for different reasons. And that's always fun. So this is so simple. I'm just using a little bit of gesso. I have, again, my plain piece of uh, muslin fabric. And you could do any design, drawing, anything you wanted. I'm doing the most boring thing humanly possible, but also just I know will look so cool, which is I'm just drawing some little white dash lines. And I'm not worried in the places where they're imperfect or they don't line up or I didn't have enough paint on the brush or anything like that. I'm just putting down some pattern. And what will happen is once we get around to actually applying the color on here, the gessoed areas will resist. Now, this should be logical to you. If you've ever bought a canvas, so I mean, I would assume everybody here has bought a canvas at some point. It is usually pre-gessoed. But one of the big things that happened in the um, modern art movement is that artists started not gessoing their canvases or only partially gessoing their canvases. So gesso is basically stops the paint from seeping into the canvas fabric. And so if you gesso something partially or unevenly, what ends up happening is that the, the paint soaks into parts of the canvas, but not into the whole thing. So that's essentially what we're setting up here is that we're blocking off part of this. So again, I'm going to put this aside to dry and then we'll look at it. And in the meantime, I have a very nice thing here that I can now pick up using anything that I want. So here is the piece that I did, right? That was stenciled. And I'm just going to press it onto here. And I'm going to be able to pick up a mono print and I can use a brayer to help me with that. I could also have put a piece of paper underneath it to have caught all that. We shifted slightly, but there you go. You can see the kind of white marks that got picked up on here. And if I use something like this colored piece of paper, did this dry already? No. Then we should be able to pick up even more again. So you can see how like, I think Cheryl Kahn and I agree on one thing, which is that there is nothing wasted and that you can absolutely always, you know, find a use for your under paper or what you extra paint you have or whatever it is at all times. Well, that didn't transfer as well as I wanted. You can see a couple little marks. It's, I don't think it is wet enough, sadly. Okay, so yeah, it's dry. Come on, come off there. And again, I'm just gonna flip that over. So here is my finished gesso resist. And I am now, um, so they had, she has a molding flexible modeling paste resist. I didn't do that one. Uh, petroleum jelly resist. I've done it before. I have a video on my YouTube channel about it from like 10 years ago. Uh, water soluble wax resist. Again, didn't do it. White candle rubbing resist. Same idea. So the metal tape, I've used metal tape before, but never like this. Check out that metal tape. So she has a really simple and easy suggestion on how to use the metal tape that I thought was really fun. So I was going to show you how to do that. So metal tape is something that you can buy at the hardware store. This comes on a roll and you can cut it with scissors. Sometimes it's called flashing tape. It has a bunch of other names. And basically all I'm going to do is you can cut it into shapes, you can, you know, cut it into strips, you can do whatever you want with it. But you peel off the backing, it comes with a paper backing on it, just like that. And then you can put it down onto your surface. Why don't we put down some more strips? 
And then I've always put it over something so that there was something under it that was creating like dimension and texture, like over something um, dimensional, like a piece of chipboard or even a piece of tape or something. Hmm. The hardest part is getting the paper backing off, by the way. If you can't tell that, I'm just pulling and pulling and pulling at the corner here, trying to get this off. Okay, there we go. Okay, so you put down your metal. We'll just put down two pieces for now. Then I am using a stylus. This is like uh, an embossing stylus. It has a little ball at each end. And you can doodle with it. So you can do something simple like lines. And again, the different tip sizes are going to give you different line sizes. You can obviously do something where you, you know, cross over it. You can do circles. Again, in multiple sizes. However you want. You could do open circles. You can do closed circles. But you're basically like pushing into the metal is the best way that I can think to describe it. And you can create some really fun patterns. If you like mark making and stuff, this is a fun way to do it. You can also just do a simple border because you're basically compressing this really thin aluminum, you know, uh, tape here when you do this. Now, it is cool just like this right? It adds some interesting texture. But when you get paint involved, and particularly when you get watered down paint involved, that's when I think it starts to look kind of antique -y and really like something I want to I want to talk about. So you can see I'm just getting a lot of paint on here. And let's put a piece of copy paper under here. Because I'm going to go crazy with the water. Water, water, water. So again, like the metal tape doesn't want to take the paint. So what ends up happening is the high points of the metal tape, you'll see the paint kind of come off, but it will sit into the valleys. You can kind of see it here while it's wet. Let's see if I can hold this up to show you. It kind of, see how it sits in the valleys and comes off the top? just like that. And so what it ends up looking like is what you see here, right? The paint is sitting in the valleys, but it came off most of the high points. I think it looks really neat. The kind of like, it almost looks like pitted metal. And you could certainly experiment with like making it look patinated and all kinds of stuff. Um, so uh, PM Artist Studio says works really well with embossing folders too. Yeah, that's a great way to do it instead of having to just, you know, do it with a stylus. Um, Donna Metz says, is it thin enough to sew through with a machine? I think so. It's tape. I mean, it feels like tape. It doesn't feel any thicker than anything else. And it might sharpen your uh, needle along the way. So Kat says, could you use aluminum foil? How fragile is the metal tape? I mean, this is metal tape that's used to repair like pipes and stuff like that. Like it's, it's right. So it, it's definitely thicker than aluminum foil. Honestly, it's not that expensive. And I think, I mean, you probably could use aluminum foil. I don't think it would work exactly the same. The adhesive on the back is helping a lot with in terms of keeping the impression and having it not rip and stuff like that. I don't think it's worth doing with aluminum foil, but give it a try. Um, and PM Artist Studio suggests that you could use yogurt tops too, like the metal foil, I'm assuming that comes on the yogurt tops too as well. Um, I did not blot the tape after painting. I just let it air dry. So just depending how much water you add onto it. This is also watercolor paper as opposed to a tag, which is what I was doing in the demo. And so the watercolor paper absorbs a lot of the paint in a way that the, um, tag doesn't, right? Because manila is not as absorbent. But even just this short drying time that it has had, if you look, it's already started to wick away from the top of here and it will continue to do so as it dries, right? Because that metal tape doesn't want to take the paint. It's just, it sits in the crevices because they're holes, basically. They're craters. Okay. So, uh, so that's metal tape. Again, cool technique. 
Then uh, rubbing alcohol. I've used it before. Didn't feel the need to do it. Paint scraping, same thing. One of the things she suggests is mixing hair gel with your paint. Um, this is one of the few projects. It's called Make a Folded Book. Although I have to tell you, I thought it was really weird that if you do the folds according to this picture, you end up with a book where the cover opens backwards. I guess maybe you open it from this. I don't know. It just seemed weird to me. Uh, and then um, PM Artist Studio says, if you lightly sand the tape, it will take more paint. Yes, I've done that. And also it's interesting because if you sand it um, before, it takes more paint. But if you sand it after, you can actually sand away like the design, which also leaves an interesting result as well. Um, stenciling with oil pastels didn't work for me. I gave it a try. Uh, the wet into wet fabric just is like wet into wet watercolor and you end up with fabric that looks like this. You can see it's very pretty. It's just letting the water kind of run all over here while you're um, mixing the colors together. Um, so that is a very cool and easy technique. Uh, the wet into wet pull wrapping, I didn't try, but this is a technique out of Shibori. So that's another fun one that you can do too. Wet into wet photo paper. I think we're talking about different kinds of photo paper, frankly. Um, wet into wet with salt, watercolor technique again. This is a bunch of different kinds of rubbings that you can do. And again, I think Cheryl Kahn's artwork is really beautiful and lovely. Um, so she shows basically the basic rubbing technique in here and then talks about some other ways. I did try this version of ironing the heavy oil pastel rubbing. It didn't really work for me. This is the result and I didn't love it. Then I also tried this technique of using this Dorland's wax. I bought the Dorland's wax and I tried it multiple times, multiple times. And these are the results that I got. There are some places where you can maybe see some of the pattern. I see a little bit of cross hatching in here. I tried different paints. I tried different pressure. I tried different amounts of paint. I tried different papers. This one is probably the most successful of all of them. Um, I, I tried a lot of different things and I just could not get it to work for me. So, and the other thing I didn't love about this technique is, I don't know if you can see this, but you see these kind of darker areas. That is the, um, wax or it's, it's just the oil. And I think it just, it's like, you can see it looks like oil stains in the paper. And while I don't really worry about longevity and all that kind of stuff, I just don't love the idea of having all of this oil, like so clearly in the paper. So, I mean, it's wax, I guess. So it's not oil. Maybe it is oil. There's probably oil in the wax because it actually like never dries. Not one of my favorite techniques, but I'm glad I did it because you should always experiment and see, and maybe I'll find another use for the Dorland's wax that I bought. Um, there's some printing with foam squares, uh, fun foam. So I don't know about you, but I have made hundreds and hundreds of stamps out of fun foam over the years. So this is an example of a huge stamp I made recently, which I really love. Okay. Lots of random shapes, just cut the fun foam, mount it on a piece of foam, super easy. And here is a piece of fabric, right? That I printed with that big stamp and you can obviously do it on paper and all sorts of stuff but this is just a really easy way to do printmaking. i happen to have cut these pieces with my scan and cut but you can also cut by hand and get great results as well so totally up to you uh and then this is jelly plates if you haven't met a jelly plate yet what is wrong with you uh, no, seriously, if you haven't done gelatin printing yet, it is addictive. It is awesome. It is just like it, probably the one tool that has absolutely changed my life. And I will say that if you want to take my um, gelatin printing class, it is pretty much everything you ever wanted to know about gelatin printing um, ever and probably some stuff you didn't. There are more than 200 videos. It is you you will have a hard time making it through all the content. There's so much content there. Um, but jelly printing can be very random like this where it's just sort of like miscellaneous shapes or it can be much more purposeful and thoughtful, um, you know, where you're really thinking about how things are laid out and you're, you know, having references. You can even create compositions out in gelatin plates. Um, I love to print fabric on the gelatin plate. So this is some fabric that I printed on the gelatin plate. Again, it's muslin, super easy. And I love to use this fabric for all kinds of things, pouches, bags, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And again, if you use fabric paint, it, 
it feels like fabric. It's not stiff at all, which is great too. So I encourage you to go ahead and grab a gelatin plate. If there's like one tool that you, that I would recommend to people unequivocally and absolutely and say that you will not be disappointed and that you should buy it and that it will change your life, it's a jelly plate. Like, I don't know how else to put it. Gelatin printing is amazing, you guys. Okay. And uh, this is another technique I want to actually show you how to do, which is this mono printing. So this is something I do a lot with leftover paint on my palette, but I hadn't really thought about making a purposeful composition with it. So I'll show you. So this is the palette paper that I use, which is gray paper. And I very often like draw into it and then just like print some deli paper randomly and then whatever. But then when I saw this idea of printing purposefully, I thought about, oh, you could actually make a composition, right? Just using, uh, you don't need a jelly plate. It doesn't look the same as gelatin printing, but it is an interesting way of mono printing to create some really cool, uh, you know, papers. So I thought I would show you that. I think real quick, this is a pretty easy one. So oh, these are attached now. So I have just my palette and let's say you had some leftover paint. And for the sake of contrast, we'll make it be black. And it doesn't even have to be a lot of leftover paint, right? So I'm just going to put out my paint and I'm going to clean my brayer. Just means rolling it off on this this paper here. And then I'm going to take, you could take anything, but I'm going to use this little thing here and just kind of draw into the paint onto the palette. You could also use a plastic bag. You could also use a page protector. You could also use um, freezer paper. You just need something that's like a slick surface that the paint isn't going to dry on. And I'm just cleaning off my tool. Then I'll take this print that I've done before and let's go ahead and push lightly. And you can see, right? I have done this really cool mono print and I can probably get another print out of this paper, maybe. And this time I can really put my back into it. Let's see if I can't, there you go. And I got, again, another print out of it. And you can keep going in this way. I don't even have to like change out this paper in any way, this palette paper, because that paint is gone now that I've mono printed with it. So I can, you know, put out some more paint. And this is an opaque paint, which is going to be important just because I need something that is not going to, um, uh, 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 that's going to not necessarily, that's going to block out what's behind it. And then I'm just going to take a credit card. It's actually a hotel room key if I'm being technical, but you know what I mean. And I'm just going to go ahead and draw through here. Again, clean your tools. Baby wipes are invaluable. Um, and then I can print onto my paper. Boop. And you can see that lovely print. And I can even take, where's that tag that I was on? Oh, that's still very wet. Um, but I can even take like another piece of paper, this one, for instance, and see now if I press really hard on my second print and get all that paint up what I can do. But this is just some really simple, easy mono printing. There you go. Got a little bit, not a ton of that teal paint up. It's just a really, really simple way. You can see I'm doing some fun mono printing without a lot of supplies. Okay. Uh, and boop. there's some, uh, lots of comments here. So, um, Paula says some cool techniques. I'll definitely be trying the glue stick resist. Inspiring as always. Thanks, Paula. Uh, Kat says all the work you do to show all these techniques. You always go above and beyond. It's appreciated. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Susan's reminding me to pull off the tape, which I will do. Believe it or not, we're not actually done. Uh, Nicole mentions that her five-year-old is watching and uh, he said, yes, jelly printing is amazing. See, out of the mouth of children comes truth. I'm telling you, gelatin printing is the best. 
Um, and PM Artist Studio says, rub off your stencils in this way. It's a great way to clean them off and get more from the design. Absolutely. I always do that. Um, there is never wasted paint. And Nancy says, this feels like a wonderful class today. Yeah, I hope that book club always feels like a class. This is what I strive to do with, you know, in my membership, or if you ever take any of my online classes, I always try to give tons and tons and tons of great content, lots of ideas and help you to be the best artist that you can be. You know, it's never copying me. It's all about allowing you to think for yourself. Okay, so let's finish up the last few techniques in this book. And then we will do some reveals of some stuff that's sitting on the floor here. So um, the Inktense Mono Prints, again, I've done it. They're great. I love Inktense. This is rubber bands. And I did make two um, stamps with rubber bands and fun foam. And here is some fabric that I printed. Um, I used this one and then I just turned it 90 degrees to get the plaid. And then this one is the one where things are sort of crossed interestingly. And I did that with this. So that's fabric, easy enough to do with these little printing plates. So I liked that idea a lot. And then um, she goes through rubber stamps. I think we've all used rubber stamps a lot now. So probably very aware of that. This is the book that she showed the basic form for earlier um paint and hair gel i did not do that silk screens i love silk screens i've taught classes on screen printing of all kinds all these different things thermofax prints so here are a couple thermofax prints that i did these are some really mess messy sort of pick up after prints um this is a thermofax print you can see with hot pink screen printing ink on just some colored paper here i did it um some thermofax printing onto fabric I think this is my favorite, great piece of fabric. Um, this is some more Thermofax printing onto paper or onto, onto fabric rather. This is, Thermofax is a kind of really easy screen printing if you're wondering what that is. This is more Thermofax printing. This is Thermofax printing and gelatin printing combined together. So you can see that you can mix them up. Um, I had a little book that I had demoed how to make during a member live stream, and I just added a little bit of, um, again, Thermofax printing straight into the book, which I thought turned out kind of cute. I'm not sure if I have any anywhere else. So that was great. Then by Funny Happistance, I happened to uh, have made a video on styrofoam plates about a month ago. These are what they look like. You can see that using scratch foam. And then this is some paper that I made using this easy, easy plate. So super duper easy. Um, and then she does have in the back of the book, just so you know, something that says putting it all together. And she sort of takes you through like all the different ways that steps that she's using to make this finished piece. Some of them, again, like I don't think it's particularly instructional, but it does let you know like how many steps she's doing to get there. She's saying 29 steps, right, to get to the finished project. You're probably not going to make this exact project. Um, but then again, some of her beautiful art decoded as to like which of the techniques she's using. So you can kind of figure out some things based on that kind of um, key. But beautiful texture. I mean, I love the stitching in this too. Just really, I want to dive into that. And then you can see, you know, this piece includes and it lists kind of the things that it includes. So um, Sherry's asking, what kind of brand of fun foam do you recommend? And there's no particular brand. I haven't found a huge difference. I just go on Amazon and buy whatever is cheap in terms of fun foam. And I don't buy the stuff with adhesive on the back because I find that that's not really good for making stamps and stuff like that. So that's the only caveat I would say. Overall, my thoughts on this book are what I said at the beginning, which is lots of great techniques and ideas. I have a huge pile of stuff here. I am going to show you both the gesso resist and the tape reveal. Um, but, you know, again, maybe not a book for super beginners. Great if you already have a stash of supplies and you just want a couple extra ideas. I do think you'll probably have to YouTube a couple things because she doesn't go super deep. And like gelatin printing is like one page and it really could fill like a hundred books you know screen printing is like three or four pages and there are entire books dedicated to it so again it's a great taster is what i would say 
Okay, so this is the gessoed fabric. So let's just take a look at how easy this is to do. Again, I'm just grabbing some printer paper to throw under here. And this is mm, not totally dry. If you can see my finger, this is not totally dry. So you would ideally have this be 100% dry before you did this. But you know, if wishes were horses, I would have a stable with a million horses. So all I'm doing is just painting over this. And you can see that where the fabric is gessoed, it's absorbing the paint differently than where it's not, right? And that's where the whole resist idea comes from, is that it's creating a different a barrier. And so again, I'm just going to apply that paint with a wet paintbrush through here. And you don't have to use a ton of water, but it does help the paint spread through the fabric a little more easily if you do. So if I painted out this whole fabric, you'd see that you would really get that two-tone effect of this coming on through. Okay. Um, Carolyn mentions that she recently made her own stamps using the thick pop fun foam that she got at Joann's. Yeah, you can use any fun foam will work 100%. Okay, let's look at ooh, this fabric. It is still very wet, FYI. Like not a little bit wet, but like soaking wet. So we'll see how this goes. But pretty crisp. Boop, 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 boop. There we go. Another X. Another X. Another X. And I think the amount of crispness has to do with how much water you use when you work into it. But there is my taped off fabric. And let's check out the paper underneath. There you go. I can see the big X running through there. So all in all, again, like lots of fun techniques, tons to experiment with, lots of ideas. Uh, I hope that you enjoy this book club. Please do check out everything I offer at juliebalzer.com, whether you're interested in private coaching or classes. The next book club is going to be on June 15th. So we are skipping May. We're skipping May. Uh, and we're going straight to June. And on June 15th, we will be discussing Improv Quilting by Irene Roderick. This is a brand new book. And even if you're not interested in quilting, there's a lot of design stuff in here that I think is really interesting. I'm certainly not going to make a ton of quilts before we meet again. But I think this book is beautiful and really fun to look at. So it's worth definitely looking up at your library or pulling up on Amazon or whatever it is. But that is it on June 15th. I hope you will join us for that. And uh, thank you so much to everybody who came here. I really appreciate seeing you and hearing all your comments. And I will see you all the next time. So be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you don't already and like my Facebook page if that's where you're watching. Thanks so much.